Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here at this early morning hour. Um, ready for our second day, which is going to be really packed with content, a longer day than yesterday. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And for this morning's uh, keynote presentation, I'm really delighted uh, to have with us someone who has been breaking ground in the world of open design. Um, Simone Ticero is program fellow for the WeShare Fest and founder of Open Think Tank in Rome. He runs workshops for strategy co-creation, product and service design, and a lot more. He also works with open source hardware and distributed manufacturing business models and strategies. So he's very familiar with this kind of approach. And he's co-chair of the Open Source Hardware Summit 2014 and International Branches Chair at Open Source Hardware Association. Please join me in welcoming Simone Cicero. Hello everyone, thanks for being here. So, uh, first of all, let's uh, start a bit with, uh, okay, sorry, this is not working. Okay, let's do like this. <laughs> sorry, I had some problem with the clicker, apparently. Oh, now it works. Magic. Uh, first of all, let's start uh, just telling you a little bit more about uh, who I am. And uh, well, as Viviana said, I'm a connector and fellow for the Wish Fest, and uh, I also work a lot with uh, open source hardware, uh, being also the uh, part of the OS vehicle team that is uh, going to build an open source, uh, is building an open source platform for automotive. But uh, let's get to the topic of today. So when I was asked to, to give this keynote here, I just uh, started thinking about what could be an interesting topic. And I felt that uh, we really need to get back to the point and, and understand what we are talking about. So I started uh, uh, trying to give you um, an idea, an overall history of uh, what, uh, what's open. And just a moment, let's do like this. Unexpected. <laughs> so all the discussion about free and open started uh, at the end of the 70s, basically, uh, with uh, Richard Stallman introducing first the topic of uh, free software, and we get we got used to the open source uh, paradigm uh, within time, and and actually most of the work uh, done in publishing and. Uh, you know, moving forward and pushing forward the, the idea of open source was done by Timo Rilli and uh, other, um, you know, other people uh, from the Silicon Valley mostly that uh, pushed forward a lot the uh, open source model in, in a business realm. But uh, the, you know, the difference between the two approaches uh, were uh, once described very well by Richard Stallman with this. Uh, um, with this sentence. So open source is considered a development methodology while free software was considered more a social movement. So one started thinking about open source uh, starting from the experience we had in, um, in, in software, in, in the internet basically, we can be a little bit biased uh, by the, uh, the, the fact that we are coming from the digital uh, world. Uh, as you know, right now the open source uh, model is uh, is moving much more broader than uh, uh, than the actual uh, software realm, and uh, is now we are used to 
uh, open source 3D printer, open source furniture, open source vehicles, open source IT racks, like if you, if you know the open compute uh, project from Facebook. Um, also, I would say open source avionics and uh, with uh, maker plane project or open source houses, as Alistair is going to uh, tell you in, in a while. Open source robots as well, but uh, I mean, the list can be infinite, basically. So what's coming up is that uh, um, while open source models are going into hardware, and in, in general, uh, some paradigm are, are coming up, and for sure one is uh, parametricity, and the other one is modularity. So uh, as, you, as you will see also today, later on today, uh, uh, while this happens, we are also starting to think in, in a modular and uh, in, you know, we are starting to define interfaces. This is from open source, uh, open structure project that uh, you, will, um, you, you will see later. And uh, basically what we are seeing is that uh, uh, design in a way is mimicking um, life. So developing common interfaces and modular approaches. But this is even a bigger trend. It's not just software and hardware. Uh, because we uh, we are seeing you know open approaches unfolding also in process de uh, design also in uh, documentation also in in general in uh, you know it's it's a broader it's a broader approach and there are uh, several associations and and uh, foundations and and more that are looking after trying to define what we are talking about trying to put some you know uh, definitions. Uh, one is for sure the Open Source Hardware Association, there is OS Initiative, Free Software Foundation, Open Knowledge Foundation, a lot of players. What, what is the bigger difference, the, what are the bigger differences that we still have when we talk about uh, design and hardware uh, per respect to the software history? You know? um, first of all, we don't have common uh, languages and frameworks. Like, uh, you know, if you, if you write code, you can use a, a language, and this basically defines the interface, you know, with the others. You use a common language, you can interface your programs, you can interface your uh, artifacts, but if you do an hardware project, is, you know, there's no language for that, at least uh, until open structures get uh, traction, <laughs> so, so big traction. And so, again, another difference is that uh, the building process is pretty different, you know? Uh, with software, you just click a button and the, 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 pro the program gets built, uh, while on, on hardware, you need to uh, probably uh, have a lab or just try start working uh, with uh, tangible artifacts. Even if the, you know, the, the differences looks like the differences are, sh are you know, shrinking because uh, just a few months ago, uh, we have seen uh, Cornell University uh, printing a 3D uh, printed uh, loudspeaker, including also the electronics and everything, you know? So it's kind of moving from a digital design to a tangible working artifact with one click. So it's getting closer. We could be uh, tempted to think that bits are really like atoms uh, today, but it's not yet the case. Uh, first of all, building in, in the you know in the tangible economy it, it implies resources. So all the processes that we that we have that we use for to produce and manufacture products they have materials and, and, and they have externalities to be considered into the picture. Secondly, uh, the, I mean the, there is some work uh, being done uh, today. We have also seen some presentation yesterday about materials that is interesting, trying to, to deal with these, uh, with these uh, aspects, you know, the aspect of involving uh, uh, tangible resources. And one is open materials from Katarina Mota, another one is uh, inter very interesting is uh, uh, precious plastic from Dave Ekans, but there are a lot of uh, like perpetual plastic projects, a lot of projects dealing with the topic of materials and uh, um, 
cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, management of resources. Secondly, access to the means of production. Also, this is changing. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the numbers with Fab Labs, they are pretty impressive. We now have more than 350 Fab Labs globally, and uh, they are growing according to, to this law that is familiar maybe to some of you. Um, it's the Moore's, Moore's law. So it's really you know, growing a lot exponentially, I would say. So even on, on the edges to means of production, the difference is shrinking. And, and also, we, we have access right now these days to you know, very powerful logistic, uh, logistics uh, chains, like the one provided by Ali Baba. That it's, uh, as you probably know, it's a portal in which you can uh, source your materials for your hardware project directly from several hundreds of uh, uh, suppliers, mostly in China. So you can ask, uh, I don't know, for example, please make me 10 items like this, and, and you get offers from several, uh, several suppliers. Then, uh, third, uh, still the capital is, is being a, a little bit different, uh, is, you know, is representing a little bit of difference between the software and the hardware world. Because obviously in software you need uh, almost no capital to start working, while uh, with hardware you still need it, but uh, crowdfunding like uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdsupply, they are really, again, um, shortening this gap. Okay, they are helping a lot of hardware designers, open designers to create projects. But up to now, wh uh, what was the real debate in, in open source, in open in general? The debate was mostly about intellectual property, and uh, basically everything uh, related to, to licensing. And we, are, we know that uh, copyleft approaches have been dominating the scene. Like, uh, if you look at uh, open design projects, most of them are CC. Uh, co Creative Commons attribution share alike, and this is purely a, a copyleft uh, approach. So basically, I, as, as a designer, I come, I come here with my IP, my intellectual property, and I decide to, you know, to leave it to, to the others according to a copyleft approach. So you can use it, but you, you need to share uh, in a similar manner all the modifications that you do uh, and so on. So this was most of the debate up to now. But um, since this, uh, you know, this, this kind of approach it just tries to regulate what you can or you can't do with a piece of information, you know, that I decide to license according to copyleft, and um, the, an interesting work uh, done by a lawyer of Penn State University a couple of uh, years ago, uh, uh, sorry, maybe less, it's in 2013, uh, just made, made us think of, uh, of this approach because uh, it basically dis demo demonstrated that sometimes all these laces, all these, uh, you know, having all these right stakeholders on a piece of information, it's harming its potential, basically. So what happens according to Clark Say is that we see what is called a tragedy of the anti-commons. So basically, I release some piece of information, but there is so much things that I need to, to care about. So uh, attribution, be sure that my license is complying with yours, and everything else, that at the end, the potential social impact of this piece of work is reduced. So why, that's why his uh, paper was called uh, A Case for the Public Domain. So basically, he was advocating to release our intellectual artifacts on a public domain, with no licensing, basically. So why it doesn't work in hardware? Because the, the, the big debate in hardware has been mostly about one topic. So the thing, is, the thing was commercial versus non-commercial uh, availability of a piece of work. So if you, if you think, for example, to, to open source hardware, um, Right now, if you don't release your, uh, your design uh, um, and you make it useful uh, commercially-wise, uh, lots of people will tell you that you are not open hardware. So, but the problem is that licenses don't work with hardware. And that's why, because basically licensing covers the 
intellectual property, and intellectual property applies to information. Okay? While what you do with hardware, so building and distributing on a market a piece of product, it deals with another layer. Okay? So basically, all the licenses like Creative Commons, GPL, um, CERN license that have been used within time to release pieces of uh, hardware design just apply to the information layer. So basically means that you can, uh, uh, I mean, these licenses are dealing with the, the, the design, not with the actual product. So basically, even if I can say that you cannot use commercially a, a design, you can still make products and sell it. And this is because in, the, in most of the cases, when I release a, this, an open design, I'm not an, a patent holder you know, for this uh, piece of design. I didn't have any patent, okay? It's just that I want to release it and I'm, I'm, you know, I put a license on that. But uh, the only solution to this in, 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 the is, in the recent history was the TAPR license. That is basically a license that you can use, but if you are the patent holder of a, of a design. So you can also uh, regulate the use on the market of a, of a product, but you need to be a patent holder. Otherwise, you cannot do anything. So basically, once the design is it's outside, people can use it to create products and marketize it. Uh, <clears throat> so, if, uh, according to, to all these complexities, you know, dealing with uh, uh, designs and uh, tangible uh, products, um, what uh, what came up is that, for example, Open Source Hardware Association is not really releasing any licensing, you know, uh, any license. It's releasing mostly a, a definition, so something that you can use to understand if you ha can can be def your project can be defined an open hardware project. It's uh, very long, it's huge. There are 12 uh, areas, 12 sections, and more than 1,000 words. Plus, you have also another document uh, that is um, best practices, so something that you can use to, to ensure that you can create a community around your project. Well, in parallel, to this commercial versus not commercial licensing debate, uh, we are also seeing another debate that mostly coming from the peer-to-peer -peer, um, family, you know, from the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, community. And it's a debate about exploitation versus fairness and fairness. So as you, uh, may, may some of you know this graphic, this was uh, made by Michel Bowens. And basically, it's, it's a, a way of uh, describing all the economic activities that are uh, uh, coming up uh, using um, networked models. And on the left side, you see what he calls uh, exploitative approaches. You know? uh, so it's, he calls it uh, netarchical capitalism and um, distributed capitalism. So basically, you have Facebook here and Bitcoin here. So, say that these are exploitative approaches, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer family, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, community is looking to favor copy what is called um, mature pre-production. And for, for this, uh, what we have is it's something that is called usually copy far left approach. In the copy far left approach, you know, uh, basically, when I'm a designer, I design something, I give this design you know, to a community, a cooperative sometimes. And this cooperative can use this uh, design and go to the market without releasing it in open source and go to the market and will get back to me with, uh, you know, uh, money or in general the value created by this. So it's, it's basically people coming together in a sort of cooperative form instead of releasing the um, information in the open, they just give it to a third party that is a cooperative party that's representing themselves and the others, and they go to the market like this. This, is, uh, this was first uh, you know, created or introduced by Dimitri Kleiner, and I suggest you to, to look into his work. Now, uh, the Peer2Peer Foundation is moving towards a more, uh, uh, more, I would say, more loose approach, but basically it means that 
uh, is advocating that you don't release your, your design in the, completely in the open, but you just give the rights to use this design to what, uh, what are called commoners, cooperatives, and no profit. So it's basically a selectively commercial license. You can, you can use it commercially, but not if you are a corporate or uh, an exploitative um, player. So the point is this at the end. Should corporate have access to the commons, to open source designs? But an interesting approach was, was that, is that of um, Sensorica. It's um, Tiberius Brass Brassavicianu, it's his founder. And uh, some, mm, you know, a few days ago, I, I stumbled upon his comment uh, on, on this approach, the copy for left approach, and he said, but why should we prevent access to non-rival goods like knowledge, even to corporations? Because, for example, sensoric approach is that of a direct competition between the open economy and the corporate economy. So if you look at what they do, for example, they created not only a sort of a cooperative agent, but basically an, a complete organization that, that is uh, able to um, coordinate strategically and account all the contributions, you know? And it's kind of a liquid organization that can marketize the ideas and the open ideas coming from a, a cooperative of, uh, of people. And it's also open, it's called Open Value Network because it's also open to new entrants and, and it's taught, it's designed to grow, okay? Uh, I cannot, I can dig into the details right now, but it's very interesting. And uh, basically, they consider them in in competition with uh, with a co normal corporate approach. But they think that this open and inclusive and kind of uh, liquid, you know, approach can be more efficient efficient than the market. So that's why they don't prevent access to these designs. The designs are still open source. So everyone can use it. And, and m even more interesting is that approach that some uh, other projects are having towards this. I will, I will talk about OpenDesk in particular, just as a tribute also to Alistair. The, it's it's in, 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 the, in the house. And they are you know, friends coming from the same studio, uh, from the same team of uh, uh, called Infrastructure 00. So basically, what OpenDesk is doing is kind of what uh, Sensorica is doing, but with a different approach. They are not building a scalable open organization. They are building a kind of a brand. If you can see, if you see that, that's what they provide to the creatives. They provide a brand, a marketplace, and also distributed infrastructure for publication. I will be more clear with, with this. As you can see, here is the brand, here is the marketplace, and here you can see that it's uh, the distributed infrastructure that is made of hundreds of fabrication labs that are connected to this network. So basically what happens with OpenDesk is that you can go there with your design, you submit your design, there is some curation process, but at the end, if your design is it's, it's, you know, selected to go into the inventory, you just don't need anything else. People can buy your stuff, and this stuff can be fabricated locally. Okay? So in this case, they are providing the brand, the marketplace, and the, and the distributed infrastructure of production. That is, you know, it's pretty important. So when I, when I meet people and they ask me, um, Am I open? Because people don't know. People don't know if they comply with definitions, with licenses. They don't know what to do. I, my, my answer oh, is often, does it really matter? So should you, shouldn't you look at your project with a, with a totally different approach, looking at the impacts, the opportunities, not at the definitions of licenses? And I say this because if you look into the background, the picture that you will see is not that, you know, it's not that uh, beautiful. Yes, this is the era of democratization. You, we know that. 
is because everything in digital is falling down in price like hell. Storage, computational uh, potential, bandwidth, all the enablers of digital are falling down in price. What's happening is that we are seeing uh, the trend of componentization, both in software and hardware, actually. And software is eating the world, as Mark Andresen said uh, very, you know, very clearly recently. And but he just picture at this process. Again, it's a bit complex to go into the details, but you know, it's not that com complex to understand this picture. So basically, what's happening in digital is that everything that gets invented, so something novel, within time it becomes a component, a utility. So it goes through a process from the novel idea to the product, to the service, to the utility. Think to, I don't know, think to um, computing infrastructure. Here you have the room size computer we invented in the 50s. Here you have a homebrew computer. Here you have the products, so mainframes, racks, and everything. And here you have Amazon Web Services. So computer as a service, computing as a service. And this happens to everything because it's created, these dynamics are created by two laws, uh, two common laws of markets, where entities compete for two things, user and, supply com and suppliers. I will not give into the details, but keep in mind that everything is going like this. And uh, we have three main phases in digital innovations. One is the phase of pioneers, startups. They create what doesn't exist. They explore the, the new, okay? They, they face uh, unexisting markets. Then you have settlers. So these are the companies, probably ex-startups, that grow and switch from uh, you know, simple business models. They grow and they, they become uh, very often multi-sided businesses. They basically exploit a growing and mature market. At the end, you have ecosystems. You have what is called typically town planners, Amazon, Google, Facebook. So the ones that face standardized demands, they optimize for cost, and they become giants. And they basically enables, enable new pioneers. This is the process. It's a cyclic process. It's called. Basically, it's called ILC uh, cycle. I will show you more in detail. So we, as I said, you go from pioneers, settlers, town planners, and you come again. Because basically, these town planners, they create the components that can be used by startups to create the new. Think of, again, Amazon Web Services, which is computing as a service. It, it created a new environment for digital startups to grow and, and, and come to the market. This is a cyclic process, okay? It's called innovation, uh, sorry, it's called innovate, leverage, leverage, commoditize process, ILC. And if you look at the picture here, you'll see that, again, this is the genesis of a new idea, then the idea gets used, it becomes a utility, okay? This is the process. You have pioneers, settlers, and town planners, but what happens at some point is that if you become a town planner, you, you start to compete on price. You know, the business is not, you know, it's not that interesting at that point because you have a lot of competition, a huge market, but if you're not efficient, you just go out of business. So what does an intelligent player that arrives here? Basically, it, start, it starts to uh, create uh, higher value services. It needs to climb the value chain because otherwise it will lose revenues. Okay, so what's happening is that this is a cyclic process, and we are we are you know going up in the value chain, creating more and more innovations, more and more high va higher value services, and this is exponentially happening. And what we see today is the so-called uh, red queen effect which, uh, in, I mean, every player in digital needs to invent something new 
and, and run and create something new because otherwise it gets out of the business. And this is, uh, this is a metaphor coming from a Lewis Carroll book. You probably remember the, the book where, uh, where the Red Queen, in the world of the Red Queen, every, everything was running backwards. So to stay in the same place, you need to run. And that's it, what happens. And it's also a biological aspect that is also seen in ecosystems, where species that don't change, they get, uh, you know, they get out of, uh, <laughs> they get uh, uh, extincted. So what we see, it's a world made of uh, modules and an interconnected society, and uh, an expo exponential explosion of data and information shared and this has been uh, recently uh, de depicted in, in the recent book from, uh, from uh, Jeremy Rifkin that is starting to, you know, to spot all this transformation made of uh, commons, uh, open source, IoT, and uh, digital uh, integrations that will uh, enable us to have productive processes that are super light, super efficient, and basically zero marginal costs. But what's happening is that we are, uh, um, we are actually legofying everything. And this is bringing a lot of uh, complexity. Everybody's talking about complexities these days. You probably know. And that's because, uh, yes, this is the singular uh, age, the age of singularity. But even if the, you know, we are going to have exponentially more answers to our questions, we are also going to have more and more and more questions that we don't, we cannot even answer. And one of these questions is, are we lego fine humans? In a great uh, recap, John Agel, a few months ago, uh, depicted all these, all these things that I've been telling you, and he also noted how this you know, increasing change, increasing transformation is creating a mounting performance pressure for uh, each of us. And this is, already, is just starting because automation, for example, uh, is growing a lot. Uh, you see, this is Baxter. It's a very cheap automation robot that you can use in your garage. This is Amazon uh, um, robot that actually automates all the, um, some of the, um, I mean, all the factories, you know, all the logistics factories from Amazon. There's no human anymore. And this is IBM Watson. It's a huge potential of artificial intelligence that can even beat humans at quizzes. Then, just a few weeks ago, you see, you saw, uh, you you know that uh, there's some some computer just passed the Turing test, so basically fooled humans, you know, and uh, uh, fooled humans, uh, making them think that it was a, another human, basically another human being. What's happening right now is that in a in a, in a cyclic innovations that we we see, we are in this phase that is called efficiency innovation. We are destroying jobs and liberating capital. And you see this, because uh, these are all the protests that have been happening in the Silicon Valley recently. Uh, so people basically yelling at Google buses, or you probably know the Uber protests for taxi drivers across Europe. So everybody's protesting towards all this transformation, basically. And if there is someone that knows how to use business, how to use open, it's business. You see, this is Android. Android was created out of nothing, basically, by Google, that decided to release it with Apache software license, a very permissive license, and this allowed Android to go from zero to almost 80% of the market in, eight, in uh, eight years, yeah. And Google is trying again with this project that is called Project Ara, that is trying to do the same with hardware. 
so create uh, like an open uh, ecosystem no to componentize hardware but if you look at the license right now just to confirm that when you deal with hardware it's a bit more complex if you look into licensing today this is the licensing for the MDK, the module development kit, so like a specification if you want to develop uh, modules like this, for, uh, you know, like this, for um, Google Project Ara. It's a bit complex, the licensing terms are a bit, you know, not that clear. By the way, using Open in Business is just another strategy move. It's strategy today, it's a game of chess. You have like, you know, a list of moves that you can take in business. And this is what uh, Google did, for example, with Android. It's called, it's one move that is called the economy of complements. So basically means that you take the enablers of your business and you dr uh, drive them down in price so your business can explode. And this has been done with, uh, with uh, smartphones because indeed, Google core business is eyeballs, is people looking at screens. And this is happening again, Tesla, you know, well, two weeks ago, Tesla announced that all these patents are free for all to use. But why? Because they want to bring price down for electric vehicles and enable, you know, since they are creating enabling technologies like batteries, infrastructures, and everything. Autodesk. Is going to be out very soon with an open source 3D printer, uh, professional 3D printer, and an open source platform for, for software, 3D software. Why? Because they want to have accurate printers to go down in price so that they can sustain their 3D design software and, automa and, and you know, system for collaboration on 3D design and everything. Samsung is doing the same with an open alt platform. I will go a bit faster right now because I don't want to waste too much time. So what they are trying to do right now, these corporates, they are trying to establish as interfaces. An interface is something where you can innovate only up or down. So basically it means that you can create a higher value system on top of this interface, okay? Or you just need to compete in efficiency with that interface. So think today, is it possible to create another open source hardware, uh, sorry, open source software for phones? It's not really possible because Android is everywhere. Android is the interface. So what we are seeing increasingly, it's what I call open monopolies. So they are open, but indeed, they are just impossible to displace. And most of the times they are brought for they are, you know, created by corporates. So the mission we have today, I guess, and now this is the last part, the mission we have today, I think, is to, to look at in the face to the problems that we are living. And one of these is social inequality. Uh, this book from Thomas Piketty very clearly, you know, shown that we are really in a, in a moment in which inequality is getting back to the levels that we have before the First uh, World War. It's really you know, impressive. And that comes from the thing that we are liberating capital you know, and destroying jobs. That's normal. Then uh, the IPCC report just in March gave us less than 6,000 days, uh, 6, days to fix the environment. Because if you don't do that in, si in these 15 years, basically, uh, some non-linear effects could uh, you know, become part of the picture and really you know, brought some major uh, disruption in climate. So what we need to do right now is reduce this extinction perspective. So we need to stop running, stop exponentially running towards something that looks like collapse. And to do this, we need to create truly open post businesses. We need to switch, you know, the objective of what it means to make, to create business, to create an enterprise. We need to switch from multi-sided platforms to multi-stakeholder businesses. 
And we can do that at several layers. Uh, it, it looks like corporates and, and enterprises understood very well the transformation from linear products to platform, but they still have a lot to do to create a truly open post business, something that can exist in 50 years from now. And the tools we have are, are a lot, and they start with what I call cult culture hacking. Because sometimes, you know, it's so hard to bring change into existing organizations. So that's what we are doing with WeShare, for example. It's creating a culture that can break barriers, can, you know, can get in the minds of decision makers. Then you have design thinking. And this is your call. <laughs> This is something that I created, for example, it's a tool to redesign products and you know, start looking into value flows and design multi-sided products like platforms. But uh, another interesting piece of work that I want to, and it's called the Platform Design Canvas. And another piece of, uh, interesting piece of work that I want to uh, point you, it's the Eco Business Model Canvas from uh, Nicola Cerantola. It's basically the Business Model Canvas with uh, uh, I mean, the, the eco design part, so uh, externalities and uh, ecological issues and everything. Third, uh, value-driven enterprises. So what we are seeing right now is that a lot of companies are developing models for uh, scalable, open, inclusive, participative, and distributed enterprises. They are sharing a lot, like Lumio that created the, uh, an open source decision making tool. Kogun Project is it's an Italian company that recently win the, won the Mix Prize from Gartner. They are creating a liquid organization protocol that is going to be released, uh, I guess, this week. Finally, open capital, the last part. And, you know, this is another. The, the, open dis the disruption of capital in the open is uh, it's another really huge uh, <laughs> amount of project, interesting project. I want to just to point to one that has been out. Uh, it's a, another Wisher fellow uh, that created this. It's called Swarm, Swarm Corp. It's basically a mix between crypto, crypto currencies and equity crowdfunding. So basically, you can create your own uh, currency and then crowdfund your, your um, enterprise. So finally, I think today, and I heard, I've heard this uh, last uh, yesterday as well, it's the time for us to take responsibility. And really, I will finish with this calling, as uh, Michel Bowens did uh, last year at the Wisher Fest. So we really, we really need to start thinking of what we do with our minds, with our time, and we need to you know, look in the face of these things that I've been talking about and try to invest our you know, creativity and share creativity into something really important. That's it. Um, the beginning is near. I, I use this slide because it's really you know, embodying the spirit of today. And we, we, we are really cautioned that we have a lot of tools right now, and it's really time for us to use it, to use them. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Simone. That was really interesting and inspiring, I think. Um, are there any questions uh, for him? We have uh, a few minutes. I, well, I, I, I actually, I was wondering about one thing, if I may. It might not be an easy thing to answer um, because it's actually very specific. You've talked about lots of different models and ways in which they interact and come together, um, ways in which they're good or their failings. Is there any particular project right now, or product, or whatever, that you think is really, you know, spare pointing the way mm -hmm. uh, and bringing together 
the best of all those things you've been talking about? Well, as I just said during the presentation, I think that the work that has been uh, done by um, OpenDesk, uh, Wikihouse guys from, from the same, you know, it's the same team uh, in a way, uh, it's really interesting. So I'm really praising that, that work. Okay. Thanks very much again to everybody.